mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. On nearly every level, this past Lenten season, this past Holy Week and Easter has been one like never before. We have been forced to scatter and separate ourselves from one another like never before. We've been forced to meet together in small groups, if we're able to meet together at all. We've had to sequester ourselves inside, in our homes, in our offices, keeping the doors and windows shut. In our separation and distance from what we have understood to be normal life, we have had to reevaluate everything about our life. Or maybe I should say, we've been given the opportunity to reevaluate everything about our life. To reevaluate everything we thought we knew about life. To reevaluate what we thought we knew about ourselves. To reevaluate the things we thought were most important. To reevaluate what we understand true value to be to reevaluate the things that filled every last short moment, minute, and second of this life that we have. Our lives that Scripture reminds us in James 4 are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And what has brought us to this place? What has caused our world to be turned upside down? chaos, the chaos of fear, the chaos of the unknown, the chaos that always ensues when we're face to face with our vulnerability and our mortality, the chaos of reality, the reality of sin and evil, and the reality of the death that sin and evil have brought into the world as God promised to every man, woman, and child, the reality that we are not and never have been in control, no matter what we have told ourselves and no matter what we have allowed ourselves to believe. The reality is that nothing in this dying world is guaranteed or forever. And it is this reality of chaos a reality that has been here all along, a reality that was here long before the coronavirus, and it will be the reality of chaos that will be here long after this pandemic passes. It's that reality and even that chaos that has provided us with an opportunity for hope, for joy, for anticipation, a time and opportunity for receiving God's gift of life in Jesus and living in the peace of Christ's victory. A victory that surpasses and a peace that surpasses any circumstance, any chaos we find ourselves in. Today is exactly one week after Easter morning. And today we find ourselves sharing more in common with those first disciples than we ever probably thought was possible. A little more than 2,000 years ago, also exactly one week after Easter morning, the disciples of Christ found themselves scattered, separated, gathered in small groups and sequestered behind locked walls, doors, and windows, reevaluating everything they thought they knew everything they thought they knew about themselves, what they thought they knew about life, afraid of death, and trying just to adjust to what they thought was going to be a new normal for the rest of their life. And all because of chaos, the chaos of fear. The chaos that came from fear of the Jewish authorities, John tells us, who just brutally and mercilessly killed their Lord, 
and who the disciples rightfully knew would kill them too because they were followers of Christ. The disciples were faced with the chaos and reality of the consequences of sin. Not just the sin of those religious leaders that crucified Jesus, not just the sin of Rome, but their own sin. Their own sin that caused all of them to abandon Jesus in his deepest hour of need. They had barricaded themselves in the upper room because that was the only control they felt they had left. They were afraid of what they didn't understand, fearful of what they didn't know. What they didn't know or understand was that their very fear, that very uncertainty, the very chaos that surrounded them and brought life to a screeching halt, would prove to be the circumstances, that would prove to be the very opportunity in which they would experience a joy and a peace like never before. An eternal joy and an eternal peace that would transcend their circumstances. A joy and a peace that would compel and even propel them to very soon put their own lives in danger and yes, even give up their own lives for the sake of that peace and joy, for the sake of the good news of the gospel, serving their risen Lord Jesus Christ, who appeared in their midst in that upper locked room and said to them on that first Easter morning, peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus would come again to those same disciples, except Thomas, a week later, on the first Sunday after Easter, this Sunday after Easter. And appearing to them again, he would show himself behind locked doors, he would prove to them again that he is with them always. This time he came to give the same promise to Thomas, who wasn't with the disciples the first time on Easter evening. He came to the disciples who were yet again still behind locked doors, still somehow in fear. And again, Jesus revealed himself to be in the presence of his people, even when they could not see him. And again, Jesus greets Thomas and the rest of the disciples with peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that means blessed are you, my friends. Because peace is with you. Because the Christ that you cannot and have not yet seen is with you. Even in your midst, wherever you're at. All of you who cry out to Jesus with Thomas, my Lord and my God. Blessed are all of you who are scattered, separated, fearful, uncertain. Blessed are you because peace is with you. Christ is with you. Blessed are all of you who have lost your jobs in this time of chaos because peace is with you. Christ is in your midst. Blessed are all of you who have had your time to mourn the passing of loved ones cut short. Funerals had to be canceled. Blessed are you because peace and Christ is with you. Blessed are all of you who have had to reschedule that wedding day that you've been looking forward to for so long. Peace is with you. Christ is with you. 
Blessed are all of you who are sick, even in the midst of this chaos. Peace is with you. And blessed are you who are dying, because our Lord is in your midst. His peace is with you, even when you can't see him. He never leaves. He never forsakes. Peace. The Greek word for that is erone. The Greek word used in the Septuagint for the Hebrew word, shalom. Peace be with you. Shalom. That word shalom from which we get the word peace has great significance. On its surface, yes, it means peace, tranquility, serenity, safety. But when Christ comes to his disciples, locked barricaded in that upper room, fearful of all the chaos around them. When he comes to you and me, even right now, in his word, the peace Christ is talking about is something far deeper and far more significant than just the feeling, the emotion of peacefulness. The true essence of shalom, the deeper meaning of what shalom means is to bring order out of chaos. It means to destroy the authority that is attached to chaos. Shalom is what God did during the six days of creation. He brought order, harmony, and life from a formless dark void of nothing. He did so by saying, let there be, and there was. After mankind fell in sin and brought chaos and disorder and death into God's perfect creation, God's love and mercy would once again bring shalom. And it would once again be brought through his word, his word made flesh in his son Jesus, born to die and who did die our death. Jesus endured the full, unmitigated chaos of God's wrath against our sin. The nails driven into his hands and feet broke through the darkness, just as when God said, let there be light, and there was light. And as the word of God, Christ, hung on that cross and said, it is finished, the chaos of sin, death, and the devil was finished. It was stilled, just as when that same Lord Jesus stood up on the Sea of Galilee, commanded the sea to be still, and it was. And when that tombstone was rolled away, tossed aside, and Christ burst forth victorious as our risen Savior, so the authority of chaos, the authority of sin, death, and the devil was destroyed. Shalom has been restored and given to you, to me. So Christ comes into his disciples riddled in chaos and says, Shalom, I have put it all in order. As scripture teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Jesus, that first evening, voluntarily showed his scars to the disciples. The evidence that it's out of chaos, even the chaos of a cross, that God brings order, life, salvation. God came into our chaos. He took on flesh to walk in it with us and for us. His body was broken, his blood was shed as he willingly welcomed the chaos of wicked men so that as only he could, our Lord Jesus would bury it along with his body. But in rising again on the third day, Christ would remove the authority of sin, death, and the devil. 
and he would remove it from us as far as the east is from the west. And that's exactly what Psalm 103 says. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Much like the disciples on that first Easter evening, and much like Thomas on the following Sunday evening, we too would not believe in Christ or in his resurrection if he didn't come to us and reveal himself to us. We so often mistakenly think that if God would simply remove all of our pain, remove all the suffering, if God would just calm all the chaos in our life, then we would finally be able to be the super disciples we know we want to be and should be. But that wasn't the case for the disciples that he revealed himself to and said, I am going to send you out into the world as sheep amongst wolves. But peace is with you, because I am with you. In his grace and mercy, God shows his faithful love to us, not by allowing us to stay locked up in a room, scared to death, but by coming to us, revealing himself to us in his word, revealing himself to us in his own scars that prove the power of God to bring shalom, eternal shalom in the presence of God himself and in the presence of our eternal King Jesus forever. Before Jesus entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, before the cross and before the resurrection, Jesus told his disciples in John 16, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Before they ever saw the risen Christ, Jesus had promised them victory. So certain was God's promise of salvation in Christ that before he was ever even arrested, tried, and crucified, Jesus told them before all of that, I have overcome the world. You and I have that same promise. You and I have that same Lord. We are never alone. For just as the Father was with Christ, Jesus prayed before going to the cross, Father, sanctify them in the truth of your word so that they are one just as Christ was one with the Father. Until that final day comes, when we do stand before God and we do see him face to face, you and I have every reason to take heart, to be glad, to endure anything and everything faithfully and with hope and with joy and with peace, to have and live in peace even in the midst of chaos and have the confidence of life even in death because it's in the chaos, in the cross, in the scars that we see his victory and that we see his shalom. I very much like what Oswald Chambers said. We're apt to think that everything that happens to us is to be turned into some useful teaching. We shall find that the spheres God brings us into are not meant to teach us something, but to make us something. That's the power of the risen Christ for you. His scars have made us eternally alive and at peace with him already. The good news of the gospel 
is that by God's grace through faith in Jesus as our risen King, we need not be scared to death or scared of death. O oh, death, where is your sting? Our Lord is risen. He's with us. He has brought us and gives us shalom now and every day in his word and in that word where we find his presence. And it's with that word and with that assurance that he has already made us fully alive that we can say today and every day in any circumstance, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.